I know what's holding you back from having the best pizza of your life, and I'm going to solve it right now. It's all part of breaking the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. Uh, we're live at noon Eastern every Tuesday, and I send out alerts every Tuesday, 15 minutes beforehand. If you're not getting these alerts, you should go to webcookingclasses.com slash live and register for the alert system because we're together every Tuesday, like I said. We're the Carefree Cooks. We create our own recipes. This brings friends and family together. It enables us to learn every Every time we cook and what happens then you define your own cooking style and you have a way about you because you practice pro methods and it all equals to loving <laughs> your cooking hey everyone good to see everyone again oh boy lots of people checking in hi Lisa hi Chris hi Mike and Terry Carol is with us from Wales again Carrie from Wisconsin is the first person into the room Ellen and Peter sales hey Peter Peter's been so active, man. He's cranking it out. One of those people that have taken the lessons by the neck, you know, and started posting a lot of great stuff. Richard's with us. Candy and Catherine and Mary and Ron. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad we're together again today uh, because I, I, we're going to talk about pizza. Now, look, a, a pizza can arrive at your door, you know, in less than an hour or 30 minutes or it's less le uh, free. Or, you know, frozen pizza. Think about the amount of square footage that is dedicated to frozen pizzas in the grocery store. Next time you're in your grocery store, it, you'll, you'll be amazed at, at like the Mega Mart store, just tons and tons of frozen pizza. Why is this? Well, it's the easiest food to be delivered. It's the easiest to pick up. It lasts the longest in your freezer. You throw it into the oven. So all this ease means that it's the easiest food to compromise on as well. And because it's so convenient, because you give up all these compromises, you're also giving up other aspects of enjoying a really good pizza. Now, I enjoy really good pizzas, and I want you to, to do it as well, because like any kind of takeout food, any kind of delivery or grab-and-go or microwavable food, it's really the convenience that's the benefit, right? It's, it's not the quality. It's like, oh, the best food I ever have is, is from the freezer section that I microwave. Oh, hands down. No, you know it's not the quality you're going for. You know, it's the convenience. Look, I don't have time. I can throw something in the microwave. I understand it. Your, your entire life can't be dedicated to food and cooking like mine is. But what I want to talk about today is taking that trade, that, that quality for convenience trade, and turning it around entirely. Let's trade away some of that convenience and get a little bit more quality in our pizza. All right, let's, let's start eating something that we're really excited about because I'm getting tired of anything on a cracker being called a pizza. Any kind of flat bread, any kind of stale white bread, it's not pizza. You're, I know what's holding you back from having the greatest pizza, and I'm just about to tell you about it before today's true or false. Uh, today's true or false is pizza was invented in China. We're all taught this, right? Marco Polo, after he was done playing the game in the pool, then he came back from China and he brought pizza with him. We're all taught this. Is this true or is this a myth? Tell me in the comments below, true or false, pizza was invented in China. Now look, 
we, we could debate all day long about what the most important part of pizza is. And I know you're going to hammer me in the comments today because some people are going to say the sauce by far, the sauce is the most important part of the pizza. Somebody else is going to go, are you kidding? I know we've got a heavy Wisconsin <laughs> contingent. Carrie and Don Traub and these people are going to scream about the cheese being the most important part of the pizza. There's no doubt in my mind. Others are going to say the seasoning, the difference between dried herbs and, and fresh basil on your pizza. And others are going to say the crust. And that's going to be the camp that I'm going to be in because it's the crust to me that makes a great pizza really special. We could argue it all day, right? You could take the greatest Wisconsin cheese and put it on a Ritz cracker. Is that a pizza? All right. Then you could take the worst cheese, but the greatest tomato sauce. It all comes down to what the, it's laying on for me, what the vehicle is. You can't do without it. You can't do without a good crust. And that's the first thing that everybody gives up. They're making pizzas on all kinds of breads and frozen crusts and, and stale pieces of cardboard. There, Some of these national places that I have not eaten a pizza from in years and years and years, sometimes you'd rather eat the box, you know? Like the tomato sauce that gets on, on the box is better than the crust they're serving you. So making your own pizza crust is the key to me. And anyone who starts doing this can't believe how easy it is. Can't believe how much better their pizza. It's, it's really, really simple. And it all comes down to a 10 step yeast dough formula. That's what I want to talk to you about today, because then this applies to lean French baguettes. You can make pretzels out of this. You, you can make all kinds of dinner rolls and stuff. Once you do this, the 10 steps, once you do it once, all right, maybe twice. <laughs> Once you do it, all right, okay, it might take three times, right? Once you do it under three times, you're going to be addicted, right? You're just going to love making bread. You're going to love the leavening and the, the smell of it baking. You're, you're never going to have a pizza delivered again. You're never going to take something out of the grocery store pizza aisle because it's very simple. And today I'm going to give you the 10 step yeast dough formula that is worldwide, world over. It's what we teach in web cooking classes to make sticky buns and yeast dough breakfast items. Oh, it's so cool. So get a pen, get a piece of paper, open up a window on your computer or start typing because uh, we're going to talk about the 10 step yeast dough process. That's going to enable you to make the best pizza crust ever in your home. You can even make them and freeze them, make multiple ones, but this way, you, again, you're going to have your own pizza crust that you can add to, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So it's the 10-step yeast dough method, and this is because yeast is a living item. Yeast absorbs, eats sugars, belches carbon dioxide, and this is what leavens your breads. So yeast being a living creature, this is the thing that we really need to be careful of and protect. And uh, my web cooking classes students hear me talk about the yeasties all the time as if they're pets. And some people had sea monkeys when they were a kid. Do you remember this at the back of the comic book, the sea monkeys? I didn't have sea monkeys. I had yeast. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, the first thing is scaling all the ingredients. And notice I didn't say measuring, okay? There's a difference between measuring and scaling. Measuring connotates scooping things. And, you know, a, a cup of flour can weigh anywhere from five to seven ounces, depending on if you're sifting or packing it. So scaling your ingredients means weighing them on a weight scale scale, everything by weight. And those of you in web cooking classes, you know my 18-10-2 formula. I have a tendency to, to bring everything down to ratios. It's so much easier for me to remember than recipes. Recipes have like 12 lines, you know, most of my ratios have three. So 18, 10, two is 18 ounces of flour, uh, 10 ounces of warm water, two teaspoons of yeast. And, and that's how I remember it all the time. So I can make this basic lean baguette dough really, and turn it into a pizza crust. Now, of course I need a little bit of salt. All right, that's not in there. Just a pinch of salt. It doesn't need a number. Um, you need a pinch of sugar to charge that yeast. And if I'm making a pizza crust, a good pizza crust, a lot of times I'm adding some kind of fat because in a yeast dough, fat is a tenderizer. 
So if I just made this 18, 10, and two with some salt and sugar, that's where you get a really chewy kind of pull with your mouth. This is good with a pretzel. But pizza, I want a little bit more tenderization. So I'm not gonna put like Crisco shortening or, or butter or some or ghee or some kind of heavy fat, but I will put a tablespoon or two of olive oil to give me the flavor and the tenderization as well. Now, it, if you wanna go into the metric, um, all for all my friends in the UK and Australia, uh, I'm sorry that it's ounces. Uh, if you wanna go metric, it's 510, 283, and 56. <laughs> <laughs> you see how that's not as easy to remember. Uh, 510 grams, 283 grams, 56 grams of flour, water, and yeast. Just stick with the 18, 10, and 2. And of course, if you're good with math, you can cut this down. A smaller pizza crust is 12 6.6 and 1.4 if I divide them each by 0.75. Nonetheless, the 18, 10, and 2 is what is what we learn uh, so that we can make a pizza crust at any time that we want. So after scaling all the ingredients, measuring them, uh-uh, scaling them, uh-huh, on a scale, then we're going to mix and knead. And this is the first mistake so many home cooks make because they under mix pizza dough. Pizza dough, it's probably 10 or 15 minutes on a medium speed. And the key is, you see in the second picture here, if you can take a little bit of the dough and stretch it and stretch out a membrane that you can almost see through, it doesn't tear a hole in it. If you start to stretch it and a hole tears, it's not ready yet. You haven't developed enough gluten. So not only mixing the ingredients together to a smooth consistency, but kneading, working that dough, developing the gluten that it's gonna make it very elastic. And this is what's gonna allow you to throw it in the air if you want, or roll it with a rolling pin, which, which is what I do, um, because you need that elasticity. This is also what's gonna give you the mouthfeel that your teeth have to tear from that slice of pizza. It doesn't fall apart like a croissant. So scaling all the ingredients ingredients is important. Mixing for an appropriate amount of time till you have a very elastic dough, kneading it for a longer period of time. Then fermenting, something else that people rush. Go ahead and put this dough in a bowl. Put just a, a lid on the bowl or a towel. Uh, people talk about a wet towel. I don't bother with that. Don't let anything touch the dough. Don't let it rise up to it because it's hard to get it out of the sticky towel. Uh, but let this sit there all day long. Sometimes I'll wake up in the morning and, and I'll let the go through the uh, scaling the ingredients, mixing and kneading, and I'll let it ferment all day long. That dough is on my stove and the warmer, the better. 110 degrees Fahrenheit is the optimal temperature for yeast. So I'll turn my oven on and I'll either put this bowl on top of the oven. And here's a, a hint for you. There is a vent somewhere under the controls of your oven where the hot air from the oven is vented out. And you might, if you have a glass top, you can see it fogging up sometimes. I'll move over by that warm air ent, uh, vent or I'll turn the oven on to 150, 170, turn it off, open the door, put the bowl in there with the door open, a warm environment all day, let it double, triple in size, and then you've got to punch it down. And you can do this two, three, four, five. You can do this as many times as you want throughout the day. It's another time where people make a mistake of rushing their dough by punching it down just once. The more you punch it down and let it rise, the more kind of malty flavor you get to it, really a deeper, richer kind of flavor that you punch it down. So you can go through steps three and four multiple times all day long. You'll get a much richer flavor from your dough, but that's not to say that you can't start it at six p.m., five p.m., have it cooked off by nine p.m. It's just going to be a little hollower, you know, just, just a little kind of more watery. I don't know if that's the right word. Anyway, then comes portioning. Okay, you've mixed up all this dough. Are you making one ounce dinner rolls? They are going to be scaled by weight, you know? Are you making two loaves? Well, you don't want them to cook differently, to bake differently, so you want to put them on a scale as well. W weigh your entire amount of dough, cut it in half, and make sure that you have two halves that weigh exactly the same amount. That way they cook similar. But in a uh, pizza crust, our portion is one. <laughs> you know, we did the 18, 10, and 2. 
That's going to give us one large pizza crust, or maybe I cut it in half and made two small pizza crusts, crusts, crusts. Uh, so step five is where I would do the portioning. Then we're going to do rounding. This is an important part to give a tight skin to your dough. And what you're doing is you're holding the dough under both hands like this, and you pull it toward you, away from you, and around. You're rounding it on the counter, but at the same time, you're pulling down on it. So you're trying to create a nice skin on that dough, and that's to further try and trap air. This is one of the steps that helps get those nice holes in your bag get or your white loaf is the rounding step that a lot of people miss. Sit it down, leave it alone for another 10 minutes or so after you have rounded. Then comes shaping. Uh, are you going to shape these into knots? Are they going to be rounded little rolls themselves? Are they going to be shaped into a loaf pan to be a loaf of bread? This is where you would shape it. If it's going to be a pizza, now's the time to throw it in the air which I've never been able to do, um, but I get out a rolling pin. It's that simple, rolling from the middle out, middle out, always middle out and turn. Don't ever run a rolling pin back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, uh, because you roll it unevenly, and now is not the time to develop more gluten. That agitation will make your pizza crust tough, after you've taken all the time to ferment it and punch it, punch it down. So kind of gently out from the center is the way I shape my pizza crust. Then comes proofing. If you were making rolls or a loaf of bread or a baguette, you would sit this for an hour or more in a warm location. Again, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. You might even have a spray bottle and spray it with water every once in a while. Water uh, helps you with uh, the crust formation. You get a crispier crust that way. As it pertains to pizza, a lot of times I skip this uh, step because I want a nice thin uh, crust pizza. But if I let my pizza, usually I cover it in some olive oil so it doesn't kind of get a dried out skin. But if I let it sit on the pizza peel for another 10 or 15 minutes, it will start to proof. It will start to leaven a little bit. And this is how you would get a thicker crust pizza. If you're making a Chicago or like a Detroit style pan pizza, this is where you would press it in the pan and you would have a proofing step because you want it to be a little bit more like dough underneath. There's really not a, a thin pan pizza, but you could do that if you want. Then it's easy from here. You're going to bake it off, usually a very high oven for as short a period of time as you can. The best pizzas in stone ovens are like 900 degrees for three minutes, you know? So as hot as your oven can go. Don't be afraid to to find the upper limits of your oven. 500 Fahrenheit, 550 Fahrenheit is usually about as hot as a, as a home oven will go. Uh, with tiles, simple quarry tiles or a pizza stone. Um, I go to my hardware store. They're like a dollar each. I don't know why people uh, spend $30 on a pizza stone. You could spend five when you go to your home improvement store. Uh, once you bake it off, take it out, then comes the cooling. If it's a piece of bread, a loaf of bread, it's very important that breads cool in their pans to retain their shape because this is the point at which things are setting, where proteins are setting, uh, any kind of proteins are, you know, uh, stiffening in that respect. And that's where your loaf sits up really high, uh, that you're going to have them sit in the loaf pan. In a pizza, there's no time for cooling. <laughs> that should say cutting. Cutting and eating is the way it is. And that's the 10 steps in the basic yeast dough process. No matter what the formula is the ingredients that you use you can make dinner rolls or breakfast sticky buns or or beer pretzels is one thing I show you in web cooking classes this makes just about every lean dough that you want if you were to add some fat to it then it's no longer lean it's more tender than you can make just about any kind of roll that you want oh people ask me all the time also after you've done the rolling pin right and you roll that flat pizza out how do you get it off <laughs> the countertop and onto the pizza peel or onto the oven. So I wanted to show you that. Again, straight out from the center, all the way around, I'll roll the pizza. And then what I do is I roll the crust, put the rolling pin on the edge of the pizza, 
and then roll the crust, roll it up around your pin, right? And notice I have a marble board. Marble, one of the best things for working dough because it doesn't get hot, it retains its temperature. And then I'll just roll the dough out on the pizza peel. So you roll it back around the, the rolling pin and then you roll it out like a carpet onto the pizza peel that's generally covered in cornmeal, in coarse cornmeal. So when you move the peel, the pizza slides out. It'll slide into the oven for you. It'll slide right off the peel. So you can move the, the pizza from the board, the marble, to the peel and from the peel to the oven. So, you know, once you start making your own pizza dough, then you are like Marco Polo, <laughs> you know? Then you are an explorer. Uh, you, you could just think of so many different pizzas. You can make the pizzas that can't be bought. That's the thing I love about being a carefree cook. It's the same thing when I go nuts about ravioli. We don't make ravioli in web cooking classes so that we can make cheese or beef ravioli. We make ravioli so we can make the stuff that can't be bought. So what if you added like oregano and basil to the dough? Like as you're mixing it, oregano and basil in the dough, garlic in the dough, um, maybe Parmesan cheese, you know, mixed right into the dough. It's amazing. You can make it chewier uh, by taking the olive oil out. You can make it more tender by adding some Crisco or some butter or, I mean, this is what is so exciting to me is when you have control. When you take control over your cooking, you're not calling for delivery, which I told you already is a compromise of the quality. You're not buying the stuff at the grocery store. That's just not pizza to me. Just if, if you're buying grocery store pizza, just don't eat pizza is the, the, way, the way that I would feel if that's all I was relegated to. And like I said, I'm, I'm in downtown Baltimore, Maryland. I have maybe 10 pizza places within walking distance of me. And there is a period of time I didn't like any of them. A new place came. I kind of like them, but I always made my own pizza because I controlled it. I, it was ready when I wanted. And I had the pride, the tremendous pride of doing it myself. And that's part of being a carefree cook is having that pride in doing it yourself. So make your own pizza crusts. I don't care about the sauce. Sorry, Wisconsinites. I don't care about the cheese right now. I care that you make your own crust because once you make your own crust, then you're going to go, hmm, I need a better sauce and I need to buy better quality cheese. That's the way it's going to be. And that gets us to the dish of the week this week. The inspiration for uh, my long uh, monologue about pizza crusts was, guess what's going on in our Carefree Cooks community? Pizzas. That's right all over the place. And that's what I started to look at all the different ways that people are taking the, this really simple kind of food and expressing their own art and creativity. And the Carefree Cooks, we all know that it's the combination of dependable, reliable methods along with your own creativity that makes truly great food. So Dan, Dan did himself a bacon and chicken sausage uh, pizza. He said that his son couldn't believe that he threw it all together at home, that it wasn't a purchased pie, that his dad had made it. And Dan says that might have been a mistake. <laughs> Telling my son I can make better pizza now uh, than our pizza place. Hey, you know, it's for any uh, uh, kind of diet as well. Oh, this was Susan. The thing that I loved about Susan's is it doesn't have to be shredded cheese. You know, nice big slices of fresh mozzarella cheese. And when we talk about a hot oven, Susan says she did this for four minutes at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And you must think, oh, Susan, she's got a really unbelievable stone oven. No, she said it's her old 17-year-old oven. She just knows how to work it. You know, she's just confident in controlling the heat. A beautiful pizza. Uh, for any diet, this is uh, Stacy's Paleo Pizza uh, with a cauliflower crust. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of diet you're on. Gluten-free diet is not going to work for the things that I showed you, but you can always make alterations and enjoy the appropriate diet version of your pizza. Now, uh, speaking of Wisconsin, Don went a little nuts this week, and he decided to create a pizzeria in his own home. He has got the crust down. He's digging his own sauce. He's doing a tomato concasse, making his own sauce. I'm sure he's got his hand on some cheese curds or some good Wisconsin cheese, but now Don says, 
says he's starting to explore with uh, different bricks, right? Using different quarry tiles, different oven settings. You know, you start playing with the heat and seeing how these different ingredients react based on the different oven settings. And this is part of the journey. So Don did a plain up cheese. God, that's gorgeous. That looks professional, right? Uh, this was a green and red pepper uh, pie that Don did. Uh, there is, uh, I think, the same cheese after it was baked, a pepperoni that's gorgeous, a uh, ham and pineapple pie, really, really cool. Uh, Bob did a pepperoni and sausage with fresh basil, nice looking crust. John, uh, there's uh, Bob's pepperoni and sausage that came off an outdoor grill. Look how nice and charred that is. Can't you just like taste the charred parts, you know? John did a uh, sausage uh, tomato deep dish, a Detroit style, he said, and a bear uh, did red onions and black olives. So that's 15 pizzas I just showed you in a matter of no time, all because we have a confident method, all because we know exactly how we're going to put these crusts together, because we know how to remove the tomatoes and seeds uh, uh, from a, a tomato, because we know how to use fresh herbs and spices. These are all the methods that I've been talking to you about, that when you put them into your tool belt, when they become resources to you, then you start to look at some of these pizzas, these delivery and, and uh, grocery store pizzas and go, oh man, I can do better, you know? And it's really, it's one of the keys. It, it's really, it's a, a, a piece of the Carefree Cook's Code. That, that when you have these skills, you own them forever. And when you know how to make your own signature pizza crust, well, you've got that for a lifetime too. So it's really cool. Uh, hey, the true false for this week, pizza was invented in China. We've all been told this. Marco Polo, we've all been told this in school. And like any myth or history, the first to write it down is the one that owns history. So who knows? To my research, uh, Marco Polo ate scallion cakes in China. And this is more like an omelet. It's a flat omelet and flour kind of thing with scallions on it. So he comes home and he says, look, I really, I want you to, says to the chefs, I really want you to duplicate this scallion thing. It was a flat thing, I think, and it, it had some stuff on it because he had never seen scallions, you know, before. So I'm sure in Italy, they were like, oh, okay, uh, here, here's a flat thing, some bread. I don't know what a scallion is, but we got plenty of tomatoes around here. So yeah, okay, maybe he invented it, maybe he didn't, but the answer to this is is false. Uh, you could Google derivation of pizza if you want. There are cultures all over the world dating back to zero and BC that took some kind of flatbread, put some kind of root vegetable and baked it. Uh, so who's to say what today's pizza was? Um, I'd give credit to Italy, <laughs> but uh, all food deri derivations are uh, made by mistake is, is my feeling. And it probably happens in your kitchen as well. You set out to make one thing and ah. it's a tremendous mistake. You wind up making something else. And then suddenly that's the thing that you like better. And that's another part of becoming a carefree cook. It's the journey. That's why we say it's not a destination and it's not a magic trick. Becoming a carefree cook truly is a journey. Hey, if you know somebody who needs better pizza, uh, you should go ahead and like and share this video. If you like it, Facebook knows that people like it and will give it to more people. If you share it, you'll know that you like it and those people will benefit from having greater pizza. And if you know someone that needs to start their own journey toward becoming a carefree cook and putting these skills in their tool book, they should get my free free guidebook. Oh, it would be so perfect. That would be so cool. It's the five forks to carefree cooking and they can get it for free in an immediate download when they go to fiveforksguide.com. Thank you everyone for being with me. It's another carefree cooks code every Tuesday at noon and a chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your cooking success.